Um, she originally started as a PhD in neuroscience at the University of California at Irvine. Then she got her postdoctorate at Harvard Medical School, was a faculty member doing research at the University of Stony Brook in neuroplasticity. After that, she came to DC and among many of her other many of her positions included Deputy Director of the National Science Foundation, the Deputy Director of Science at the White House, and her favorite title, the Chief Scientist at NASA. Um, please give me a warm welcome for Dr. Kate, Kathy Olson. I'll, after I finish as well. Um, anyway, is that too loud? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, and I'm not a commercial. Um, first of all, before I start, I want to introduce Nate Stamp. He's kind of behind there, and he is going to be um, helping out uh, with some symbolic uh, puppets uh, that sort of depict sort of this stuff that I'm going to be uh, talking about. But as I said, my favorite title ever at um, uh, in the government was the Chief Scientist at NASA. So I want you to know that um, when I talk about this, I lot of have I have Mar Mars and Venus up there because my own research was on sex differences in the brain. And um, Nate's going to uh, actually put on the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus was the area of the brain that I worked on because it's very important for the four Fs. Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and reproduction. And so that's the area that's critical for sex differences in the brain as well. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the um, hypothalamus uh, later on. And he has it represented as a, a broiler. But this, this is the high school I went to. It was Cleveland High School in Portland, Oregon. And it was very interesting because what it said um, in the door that I entered is, what we are to be, we're now becoming. Well, I just want you to note that the one thing I knew I was not going to be in high school was a scientist, and I ended up as a scientist. So I want you to know that um, all of you has that potential to be anything that you want. But what's interesting is this slide also is very important for my talk because I'm going to be talking about the brain, the neuroplasticity of the brain, and the teenage brain, okay? And what we know now, which we didn't know when I was going to graduate school in neurosciences, is basically your brain is evolving, is changing during the years from 12 to 25. So it's really true that what we are to be, we are now becoming. So this is a picture of the brain. And um, I'm going to walk around, and I want you to know, can you still hear me? Because that other mic is um, uh, really, really quite, um, uh, quite loud. And the brain is um, actually organized in systems. And so here's sort of a, a big picture um, right here in the back of your brain. It's actually your visual cortex. And we're going to be talking a lot today about the prefrontal area. And this is the area that makes us uniquely human. It is the area that's important for our values, our right and wrong. It's the area that actually in inhibits you later on in life for risk aversion behavior. Other areas, as I said, I've already talked about the, the hypothalamus, which is the hypothalamus is an area in the brain that is in almost all species uh, that we study, from lizards to humans. Because again, because of the four Fs, it's so critical for um, uh, the ability to survive and to adapt. We're also going to be talking about the amygdala, the amygdala, actually, in the human brain, is the size of an almond. And that is an area that's also evolving and changing in the teenage brain. Um, the brain stem is sort of like right here, as you can see down here. And they have all your cranial nerves, but also your vital functions. And so again, the brain stem, the hypothalamus, um, are part of the, what we consider the old brain, along with the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, I think you've heard a lot about, and you're going to hear about today too, and that's the area that is known for learning and memory. And that is also the area um, that's actually, it's named uh, after 
a seahorse, uh, French is hippocampi, and because that's what it looks like in terms of the brain. And uh, so I'm going to be talking um, a lot about um, the brain areas. And I actually, you can't see it because of the lights and that, but I brought a brain uh, today so you can have like a better, uh, I think I'll pick it up here and that in terms of C, kind of a better understanding um, of this. But you've got to have kind of an understanding of the brain before we start talking about what your brain is actually looking at. Here's another uh, picture of that. Uh, in terms of the, the side view that um, uh, you're seeing. And, and again, what's really nice about the brain is it's a bunch of systems. So it's made up of individual cells, uh, neurons, and glia, but it's actually divided in terms of systems. And they'll have like an area of the motor cortex. And in that area of the motor cortex, we'll have specific places that's involved with um, your limbs, your hands, uh, your legs, uh, et cetera, in terms of the, the motor part of it. And what's interesting is when we're going to talk about neuroplasticity, I'm really curious in terms of all your texting that you do in terms of how that brain area is changing to have more of the area devoted to texting than it did in terms of my day. This is, okay, so we have sort of the big picture of the brain. This is a view, I, I consider a cross-section in the cerebral cortex. That was that area in the very front of the brain, which is uniquely human. And this is, just shows you a picture of the neurons within those areas. And again, I'm just sort of showing it to you because of the, the real complexity um, uh, in, in the brain and how this depicts it. And so here's a cartoon of actually that previous picture. And what this is, is this is a neuron, okay? And uh, it actually is the axon, and it connects to other neurons, okay? And it actually does that through um, neurotransmitters. And Nate, uh, uh, Nat, yes? has his depiction of the neurotransmitters. And what happens is electrical impulses actually are, are uh, emitted down the axon. And with enough strength, it causes um, the end of the axon, which is the futon, to release chemicals. And these chemicals are, are words that you probably already know. Dopamine, ser um, serotonin, uh, epinephrine. Uh, these and they actually then communicate to the other neuron, okay, to actually pass that uh, information on. And so they do it by electricity and chemical. And then with enough chemical stimulation, it gets it going, and it acts with electric charge, and it talks to the next neuron. So it's a really, really dynamic process. And what's also very interesting about this, this is called the synapse. And before... We couldn't actually visualize the synapse until the 20, 1920s. But we always knew that it was there, and it was called, as I love this, the protoplasmic kiss between two cells. That is the synapse. Raymond Hicohol, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, described it that way. And this is just a snapshot of the brain, OK? Again, it's from uh, the Supercomputing Center at, at Pittsburgh. But you can actually see, again, how complicated and how incredibly dynamic the brain is. Now, what I'm going to be, because of the fact that I've spent most of my career in uh, Washington, even though my own research was on the hypothalamus, um, what I'm going to be doing is talking a lot about other people's work, because I haven't actually done research in the last 10 or 15 years. And so I'll have a lot of citations of other people's work that have really shown um, the dynamic nature of the brain. But let's, let's do some brain facts, OK? Number one, the adult human brain weighs three pounds. I'm going to walk down here right now, because I always like to have sort of a people feel um, what three pounds weigh. So I actually brought in the weight. So you know, OK, you have to walk. And do some exercises important for the brain, you're about. 
but in three pounds. You know what's interesting though? I've got to do it now. I'm going back upstairs so I can get the mic. Okay. What's interesting is if you weigh 200 pounds, you actually have about six pounds of microbes on your body, and your brain only weighs three pounds. But the brain is uh, three pounds. It's uh, um, it's about two percent of your total body weight, but it's twenty percent of your total body in, in energy. And when I was in graduate school, we used to say what the human brain was was a bowl of jelly that conducts electricity. Another fact, the actually largest brain of any mammal is the sperm whale brain. And that actually weighs 17.636981 pounds. And if you think about what the whale does, he must or she must navigate systems across oceans, a thousand meter dives, and, and very strong communication and social systems. And they, the, the, the whale actually has a larger brain than the human. The other thing to think about is in that brain, and I showed you that one little snapshot, that one little snapshot of the brain, but there's over 100 billion neurons. There's 10 to 50 times even more glia cells. So neurons are sort of like they call the master cells. And there, that was the picture that I had showed you in terms of the cartoon. They're the ones that are communicating and working together. But surrounding uh, the, the neurons are the glia cells. And they're, con they're considering nurturing uh, cells, but they also play a very important role. So if we think about the number of neurons, a nematode, which a lot of neuroscientists study, has about 100 neurons. The fly has about 100,000 neurons. And our brain has 100 billion neurons. So if we look at, again, thinking about that picture that I showed you from the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, we're looking at the membrane surface within that three pound thing in our head, it's 25,000 meters squared, and that actually equals to four soccer fields. Okay? More brain fat. <coughs> communication system. I talked about the fact that it's electrical communication between the two. There are 300 to 400 firings per, sec uh, per second. So right now, your brain is just firing away. And it's about one to a hundred tenth of a second for a neuron to fire. As I mentioned, the synapse, the protoplasmic kiss between cells. In the cortex, in the area in the frontal cortex, which is, as they say, uniquely human, there's 0 0.15 quadrillion synapses just in that area. And the synapses are the size of 20 to 40 nanometers. That's why back before the uh, 19th century, we were unable to see them. And a synaptic vessel contains about 5,000 chemical mo uh, um, molecules, as I said, the neurotransmitters, um, like serotonin and dopamine. More brain fat. Axons. So I pointed out the axons versus the cell body. So if we look at the axons, there's about 120,000 miles worth of axons all wadded up in terms of that brain. If we look at the human optic nerve, and that's just going from the eye to the visual system in the brain, there's 1.2 um, uh, million fibers, just in terms of the optic nerve. If we look at all fibers combined, and this is my favorite factum, is, and we put it side to side, it would go to the earth, to the moon, to the earth. So when I became NASA chief scientist, I was the first biologist ever to serve in that role, and I kept thinking, wait, NASA, the brain? Well, now I know we've got a connection because we can go from the Earth to Moon back to the Earth, uh, basically by the number of fibers. So I'm telling you these facts just so you get kind of a handle on really, really the importance and the complexity of the brain. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about the Obama Brain Initiative. But you can see why it's so important to study this three-pound organ, because it's who we are. It's how we become. It's how we remember. How do we forget? Um, it's so important uh, for our, our lives. So here is a, a drawing, and it's from uh, Diamond and Hopson in 1998. 
And this is what your brain looks at first, okay? And this is an area in the cortex. This is in three months, so you can see this evolution of the brain. And this is in two years. Well, back in 98, it was sort of uh, accepted. In fact, when I was in graduate school, it was accepted that really um, the number of neurons that you're going to have and how the brain was, was really developed during the first few years of birth, and after that, you're only going to be using it, uh, losing it. We also know now you use it, um, and you can actually make new neurons, new, new connections all throughout life. If you don't, you lose them. And I put this up here, Hubel and Weasel, as a reminder. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize, and they were the first ones to really illustrate neuroplasticity in the brain. So what they did is, I can't hardly see you guys, but um, how many people have cats? Raise your hand. And have cats, okay. And, and you know when the, the kitten is born, um, their eyes are closed until about 10 days uh, of life. And then after that, they open up their eyes. So what Hugo and Weasel did was a very clever study, okay. What they did is they had normal little kittens, but they didn't allow their eyes to open up for several days after um, they were supposed to. So instead of um, having them open up at 10 days, they opened up about 12 or 14 days. And what they found was when the kittens opened up their eyes later, uh, they were unable to see because the environment was putting light on their, their um, light was getting into the eyes, um, shapes were getting in the eyes, their focusing was getting in the eyes, and they were actually forming these synapses and these connections in the brain given the environmental impact that allowed them to see. And so that really started the whole research on the fact of the importance of the environment, okay, and the effects of the environment in terms of changes of the brain. So my own research, as I mentioned before, was on sex differences in the brain. Okay, His brain and her brain. And I will tell you that there are many differences in the brain. There are more individual differences than there are sex differences. But there are um, uh, differences. No differences are, are, are good or bad. They're all very unique and makes us who we are as individuals. So today, I'm going to talk about the birds and the bees and sex differences in the brain. So this is research by Art Arnold at UCLA. And Art works on um, these uh, zebra finches, okay? Very nice birds that sing, okay? And uh, this is the male bird, and this is the female bird. And it turns out the male bird sings, and the female bird doesn't sing. Okay? And so what Art was very interested in is looking at the brain of these birds in terms of the auditory system to see how it's coordinated in terms of structure and function. What does the brain look like versus the behavior? And this is, again, the male and the female. And this is the male brain in the auditory cortex. And you see this large nucleus here. This is critical for song. And if you actually see this in the female, it's very little. OK? There's very little brain cells here. And again, so you have sort of structure, song, no song. But what we're interested in is where does this development occur, you know, in terms of the, the sex differences. And so what they found is that during development, okay, um, boys and male species are exposed to testosterone and females are not. And it's in the presence of this testosterone that actually what you see is the changes in the brain. So what he did is he took a female bird and during development exposed her to testosterone and then adulthood gave her testosterone and she was able to sing and then when we looked at her brain that was exposed it looked like that of the male brain. So again what you see is this dynamic 
neuroplasticity in terms of change. And I think Nate um, has um, a house with a level being added to represent how the brain can change over time with neuroplasticity. And exactly that really depicts exactly what's happening with the exposure to testosterone. You actually have the second floor, the more neurons that actually then um, uh, is uh, correlated with the fact that you can um, uh, see. And you see this a lot in terms of uh, the brain and neuroplasticity. So what happened is by chance of birth, and again this is Art Arnold, he had a bird that was born where half of the bird looked like a male and the other half of the bird looked like a female. And so he actually was very curious in terms of what did that brain look like? And I will show you in the next slide. What's really interesting is the female side of the brain looked like a normal female and the male side, and it was empty here, so here's the female side, and then the male side had a double dose of the genes and looked like that. So the brain actually was correlated with the phenotype and, and the behavior of the bird. So one of the most dynamic areas, and think about it, why, is the hippocampus. And Um, a picture, okay, a hippocampus. Um, Nate has a picture and a frame to represent the hippocampus and how it fills and makes memories. So think about it, okay? You're, you're, you're coming in for a test, okay? You have to learn that information, okay? Where are you going to learn it? You're going to learn it in the hippocampus, in this area. Okay, two days later, the test is over. Maybe we've forgotten it. So obviously, if you've forgotten it, the memories are not consolidated any uh, more in terms of the hippocampus. So you can see why this would be a very, very, very dynamic um, structure in the brain because you're constantly um, learning new, um, uh, new information and you also tend to forget information. What's very interesting, and this is work, uh, this is a uh, uh, neural analysis Dr. Christine Gall that happens to be one of my, my very best friends. And this depicts, as they say, the hippocampus and, and the layers of the hippocampus. What's interesting is, okay, let's say you go into, your, you go home and um, you walk into the house and you smell cookies, or you smell um, something that the dog did, or something like that. What does it do? It brings back memories, right? You're walking down the street and it's spring and you smell the beautiful flowers, and all of a sudden it will trigger some things that you did like three years ago during the spring period. Well, it turns out the olfactory bulb, okay, the smell centers of the brain is connected immediately to the, to the hippocampus and one synapse. So they have one line to get there. So it's not making one connection to another connection to another connection. Because smell, again, is so important for survival. Think about it. If um, you're an animal and um, you eat something, and it kills you, well that's uh, your evolution, you're not going to contribute your genes to the next generation, but let's say you smell it, you take a little nimble and you get sick, well you're going to remember that, that you're not going to eat that again because it made you sick. And many of you in the room might have gotten the flu, but it had nothing to do with it, but basically you ate something before and you're never going to eat that again. I have that with cherry cough syrup. Cherry cough syrup makes me sick to even smell it because I remember having to take it when I was sick. But the uh, olfactory ball is connected to the hippocampus. But anyway, so the hippocampus is showing, always showing very dynamic changes, um, and again, throughout life. So here's a picture of the pyramidal cell, and on the pyramidal cells are these spines, which are making the synapses. And what's interesting, and in the next slide, is this is a rat. This is uh, Kathleen Woolley's uh, work, and she's uh, done it before. And this is a rat brain, because it's much easier to do research on rats and understand what's going on. Um, and what she's done is she's looked at the rat brain, 
over her, or the rat has an estrus cycle, girls have a menstrual cycle, but what happens is in the exposure of estrogen, with more estrogen, they're making more synapses, and during the stage of the rat reproductive cycle, there's actually um, losing and gaining neurons because things like estrogen and that are very important in terms of uh, modulating the brain and changing the behaviors that reflects in terms of memories and learning. Okay, how many of you are learning a language? Okay, another language. How many of you started learning that language when you were very young? Okay, so when you started when you are very young, whoops, when you started and very young, okay, you actually, both languages are being processed within the language center of the brain. So the language centers are sort of like right in, right in here. But when you're actually learning a language, okay, like myself when I learned French and German in high school, I was actually learning it more in the motor cortex than I was in terms of the, um, the language center. And so here is sort of the unpracticed brain and you're using two areas and once you get uh, fluent in the language, then it all comes in and processes. And so it's very interesting. And so if you learn the language at the very beginning, at, in the first few years where uh, your brain is very, very plastic in that, you're boning, learning both of those languages uh, within the same language center. When you're learning it at your age, you're actually learning it in two areas of the brain and then hopefully it will come uh, together. Now, I will guarantee you, mine did not. Here's my French. Bonjour, Jean. Como va tu? I was actually in France one time, and I was with a couple that could only speak French. And all I could say was, the flowers in your garden are very pretty. Les fleurs dans le jardin est très beau. And then they couldn't understand that. But then I said, les fleurs de rouge est très très beau. Okay, because my, I guarantee you, I have never been able to get my brain into that aspect of that. Okay, but that's just something I just wanted to show because, again, a lot of us are taking languages. So, Fred Gage, I think one day, I'm going to bet on it, is going to win the Nobel Prize. And Fred Gage is at UC San Diego. And when I was in graduate school, and so this wasn't that long ago, but up until about um, 15 years ago, we didn't realize that the adult brain, okay, and I'm going to get on the teenage brain, the adult brain can actually make new neurons. And what he did is he took some mice and he had, gave the mice access to a running wheel, okay? So the mice was doing exercise. And then when they looked at the brain in the, hypoth uh, the hippocampus, of that brain, with the exercise, what they found is that mice was actually making new neurons in the adult. So it's very, very exciting. What was interesting about Fred Gage's study, though, is if he took mice and he kind of forced them to run in the running wheel and not volunteer, and then he looked at the brains, they didn't make new neurons. And so I've learned that. So when I go to the gym now, I'm not forcing myself to go to the gym. I am volunteering to go to the gym and work out, so hopefully I am actually making new bra new brain cells in my uh, hippocampus when I exercise. Bill Greenall, uh, University of Illinois, what he's done, and it, again, is to put rats into really exciting environments. And so these rats were able to um, have running wheels, have new objects every day. They brought in novel novelty to the cages. Uh, they were actually roomed together and not alone. Uh, rats are very social animals. And what he found there is that the animal is that the animals that were in the complex uh, environment actually and had new experiences had more synapses on their neurons. Okay, that they also learned to navigate optical courses. Um, uh, ones that did that have more neuron, uh, synapses for neurons, engage in simple exercises. And so again, whether or not it's blood flow, it's oxygen, we know that when you study 
and you're working hard and you're exercising, you're really helping the brain uh, to uh, be as dynamic as it can be. Um, so this, again, was very uh, exciting research in terms of the neuroplasticity of the brain. And the social environment, uh, interactions, uh, I, again, um, always taking on new tasks, new challenges is really important uh, for brain. So the bottom line is that rapid complex environment exercise program, their neurons form more synapses, the neurons are wrapped with in simple cages with little opportunity. Um, the environment and physical exercise increases neurogenesis in the adult brain, and that memory and motor control tasks stimulate hippocampus to double neurons from 3,000 to 7,000 within a day. So I think, um, I, I showed you a picture of my high school, uh, Cleveland High School in Portland, Oregon. Uh, one of the famous, most famous people that went to my high school was Phil Knight, who started Nike. And you know he has his little swoosh and he says, just use it. Well, I think that he was ahead of his time because that's exactly what you need for the brain, is just use it and you won't lose it. And so what happened is about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we started getting technology, PET, PET it's called an NMR, which, MRI, which can actually see in the brain, in humans, non-invasively. So that you don't have to die to look at your brain. We can look at it when you're alive and you're moving. And what they found is, again, making sense that in the auditory cortex, this is lit up when you hear the word. If you see the word, the occipital cortex, that's the back of the brain. If you're speaking the word, just like what you saw in terms of the language center, okay, uh, it's another area of the brain. And if you're actually generating the word, you're using another area. So the brain has the systems that are coordinated with the functions, and we can actually be able to see it with MRI and with PET scan, non evasively and so Jay got uh, Z, and he um, gave me uh, a series of the slides, was actually, he's a scientist at NIMH, and what a great field trip is to go out and visit his laboratory. And he was very interested in autism and the genetic environmental impacts of autism. So he started looking at the brain through MRI of autistic children and also children that did not have autism. And what he found um, unbeknownst to everyone, is that around the age of 12, and up until about 25 now, is you're seeing a wave of growth and change in the adolescent brain. And it's interesting, he believes that what you're doing in adolescence, whether playing sports or playing video games, could affect the brain develop, as I said, the thumbs and uh, texting. But, but he was able to discover that in certain areas of the brain, just like what I showed you in that picture that was happening, uh, is that you're having neuronal brain changes. And so what he found, and others have replicated, and now there's a whole incredible group of scientists working on this important topic, is what happens is we're seeing a rapid growth of brain matter and the formation of new connections with the brain. So during this time period, in your brain right now, and you remember the brain data, you know how many seconds and how many synapses you're doing, you're having a proliferation. And then what happens um, during this time period is you're pruning away. You're cutting away unused or unimportant connections. So if you're, like when you're learning something, you know how sometimes you've got to repeat it over and over again. Well, let me tell you, when you age, you've got to really repeat it over and over again to make that connection. And you're doing that, you're remembering it, because you're using that part and you're making that connection. Well, then you kind of forget because you're not repeating that the connection's gone. So what happens is during this time period, you have a proliferation of these brain cells, but you're also having death of the cells that you're not using. And so the other thing that you're, what's happening is myelination. And myelination is insulating the brain pathways to make them faster and more stable. And what it is, it is actually your axons, if they're myelated, the electron, uh, electrical pulses can go down much, much faster than if they're non-myelinated. And during this time period, you're actually taking your axons and making them more efficient and more um, and, and quicker so that you can actually remember without having to Google, you know, what's that person's name. 
So these are the areas of the brain that are actually changing dynamically in the teenage brain. The frontal cortex, okay? And the frontal cortex is often referred to as the CEO of the brain because it's responsible for planning, strategizing, judgment. Okay? Recent research has shown that this area undergoes a growth spurt at around ages 10 to, uh, to 12, followed by the pruning and the organization of the neural connection. So this is the area that actually puts the brakes on your risky behavior. So I have a, I'm a skier, and so someone, uh, I watched this kid jump off this cliff, and I went, oh my goodness. Now, I go up that cliff, and I said, I'm going to walk down the back side of that. Um, but that's because my brain has already shown what that risk behavior is going to do. It's interesting, risk behavior actually increases among your peers. So if you're by yourself and you're looking at that cliff, you kind of say, oh, I don't think I'm going to jump that on my snowboard or my ski. But if you're with a group of friends and they're all going, okay, let's go for it. Uh, and so you, you'll see that in terms of recklessness and areas. The other area that's changes is the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is actually the connection between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere and the number of the axons that travel back and forth and that's actually also getting bigger because, again, more connections are being made, your axons are being um, uh, uh, myelinated. The cerebellum, that's right back here in the back of your head, and that's the relay center. All the, you know, your legs, your arms, all of the nerves and the things that are coming up through there all come through the cerebellum that then connects with the rest of the brain, the motor cortex, the sensory, and that. And that part of the brain is involved with coordination muscle and physical movement and again coordination of thinking processes as well and it's going through a very very dynamic change and this is work by Cheryl Sisk at Mount Montana uh, Michigan State University and Jay uh, Gill again at NIH and the amygdala which I have another slide as I said that's the almond shaped uh, area and the amygdala is very important because it's the, really the center like the hypothalamus but it's involved in your emotion. Okay? So, um, Nate actually has a depiction of the amygdala. And he says he has two children on a bed with a monster underneath it. One child is under a blanket. One has an axe ready to fight it. This represents the fight or flight mechanisms of the, amyg of the amygdala. So, what's really interesting in terms of a sex differences in the adult brain. Okay? They've done this in MRI. And I find this very interesting. And so this is a note for the women in this audience. Okay. So if you show a, 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 you have a, a person, a male, a boy, and a girl, or a man and a woman, and they're having the MRI in their brain being done, and you show them a picture of someone happy. Okay? And you want to see when can they push the lover to say happy. Both males and females can actually recognize happiness almost immediately, okay? And the amygdala lights up and, and other areas of the brain lights up and go, yes, that's happy. In terms of sad, girls can actually detect a face that shows sadness incredibly quickly. This is one of the ones where there are sex differences. Guys have a hard time detecting sadness. So when I'm with my significant other, I let him know that I'm sad. I'm not like kind of moping and showing my, my, my things down here. I'm going like this. I'm going, see this face? I am sad. This is a sad face. Note that. Because I know that his brain is not processing as well as your girlfriend can immediately say, oh my god, she's so sad. So these are things that you learn in terms of neuroscience. But one of the other things that's very interesting is fear. Okay, and to see like a face that's angry or a scary face. And again, adolescents, teens have a hard time, unlike adults, recognizing a facial expression that is that of fear uh, and anger. And this is work by Deborah Yergogun Todd uh, when she was at the McLean Hospital in Belmont, Mass. And he says, all the adults identify the emotion as a fear, but many of the teenagers saw something different, such as shock or anger. And when she examined the, um, the changes, what she found 
is that teens use less of the prefrontal region than adults when reading the emotion. So that you're actually using different parts of your brain during this time period, and the amygdala plays a very important role. Here's another one. She worked at the National Science Foundation, and she put this slide together for me when I was there, and I loved it. So she says, teens, especially boys, misinterpret the expression fear as anger. And again, what they show is more in the amygdala and less in the prefrontal cortex, the one where you do your reasoning. There's more activity and, and adult, uh, more activity than adults in the emotional uh, networks, okay? And you see here in the adults, they have very little when they're looking at faces, where here your amygdala is just really lighting up. And so some of the implications is, you know, is what you're expressing, you know, is it a true emotion or is it a deception? Uh, effects of early environment and stress on, on later social skills can also influence this, and also uh, emotional uh, intelligence. And again, this is some research that was funded by the National Science Foundation, and um, she provided me the slide. So what's happening? Okay, what's happening to your brain right now? So what you're see seeing, and, and again, uh, this was um, a slide that I got off the internet because I thought it was really good, but it's really research that Jay at NIH uh, has done. And what it's doing is red and yellow is less mature, and blue and purple is more mature. And so you can see this dynamic change that's occurring Preteen here, teen here, and then uh, actually 25 years of age is when they say that uh, you get the adult brain. What's interesting, Hertz rental car would never rent a car until you're 25, and this is before the data came, so they actually knew before we did at neuroscience. What's happening here is here you're having more what we call the gray part of the brain, which is cell bodies. Okay, remember the cell bodies, and here you're having more of the white part of the brain, which is the myelinated axon. So what's happening is you're having the pruning, you're having more of the ax, uh, axons, uh, and uh, actually becoming more mature because the synapses are going faster and um, quicker. So here's uh, one picture. Uh, here's another one that uh, Jay gave me this slide to use. And again, this is the side view of the brain, this is the top view of the brain, and you can see that also um, the maturity from five years of age to 20, okay? But what also what you can see is maturity takes place quicker in the back of the brain and moves up to the front of the brain. And the back of the brain, back here, in this part, that's the area that almost all animals have because that's your brain stem. So that's your vital functions, your, how your heart, your breathing, uh, as I say, I've already talked to you about that hypothalamus and those four Fs, uh, et cetera, and some of the learning uh, and the hippocampus, the Olympic system. Okay, so those are sort of in the back of the brain, and they mature faster, and then the, the cortex, the thinking, uh, the values, those uh, actually take later to mature. Okay, and here is sort of a cartoon depiction of... Um, the volume of the brain, prenatal, and again, post-birth, so uh, first year, second year, when you're 7, 16, this is what's happening right now, and when you're 30. And this is the synaptic refinement, that's what the pruning is, that's what you're going to be using. So what you're doing now is your experiences and, and what you're using is really going to dictate what you are going to be in terms of the adult. Uh, the blood flow, increase in blood flow, the myelination, as I said, that's the white matter. Uh, and again, um, that's, um, um, should be increasing, but then going down, uh, et cetera. So you're having a very dynamic period right now. And this is research by another fantastic researcher, Robert Gall, you see at Pittsburgh and now at Berkeley. And what he's done is video game. That the interpreter changes in the Olympic system 
um, in terms of increasing uh, sensation seeking, novelty seeking, uh, motivation, uh, how social networks uh, affect this, uh, the frontal cortex engagement, uh, et cetera, and looking at both the positive growth trajectory as well as the negative. And there's a lot of really, really exciting research. And if anyone wants any of these articles in that, um, you t contact Jennifer in that. I will get them to you. So what we've learned. Adam that it really is evolving. And maturation is really not complete until about age 25. And again, I cited um, a lot of the research and news uh, in terms of my talk. Uh, Jay uh, at NIMH, Robert Dahl at UC Berkeley, Cheryl Sis at Michigan State University. She's got some really interesting work on uh, binge eating uh, in terms of adolescence and male-female differences. And Sarah Jane Blakemore uh, of the UK. And these are star researchers in this area. So I just kind of wanted to end because I don't know how many of you guys are sleeping right now because I can't see you. Um, but, yeah, but sleep is very important during your periods of brain maturation. And it turns out, it's interesting because I actually, as a teenager, I didn't wake up until about noon on the weekend. Uh, and that was because my parents forced me out of bed. But it's interesting. Um, what you do during this time period is you actually need more sleep. So when your parents are calling you to wake you up, you're going, no. The research data indicate, mom and dad, that I actually need more sleep. Let me sleep. But sleep is very important. But actually, it goes from the lark to the owl. Um, you actually, because of sort of the changes of your sleep pattern, and it turns out your video screens actually uh, affect melatonin, which is important for you to go to sleep. And so if you're looking at your screen, it's actually keeping you awake, so it's harder for you to go to sleep when you want to even try to get to sleep. But what happens is you have an increase in need, but then during daytime, you actually have a lot more sleepiness. And so um, it really can affect when you're taking your tests and that. But you need about nine plus hours a night of sleep. And uh, here's a study that shows the reaction time is much better in the afternoon than they are in the morning. Okay, Lower means better. Okay, So the students perform better in the afternoon than in the morning. So in that way, you go, OK, which courses do I want to take in the morning on the test? Which courses do I want in the afternoon? Maybe I could you know, tell my teacher, I go, no, no, I really studied for this test. The problem is, is you gave it at 9.30 in the morning. Had you given that fake test at 11.30 or, I mean, at 2.30, my God, I would have gotten 100. Excuse me. It is not. It's my brain here. So uh, we can use some excuses. But, uh, but anyway, but you do perform good at both times. So I also wanted to talk about a little bit, because I'm talking about sleep, and I'm talking a little bit about stress. OK? Mild stress is good for the brain. And there's actually a sex difference. Girls with mild stress actually perform better than males under mild stress. So males, you have to be calm all the time. You should all be doing yoga, going, mm -hmm, and that. But if you stress your brain too much, you actually kill cells in the hippocampus. Okay, uh, And stress can be actually uh, toxic. Uh, this is Cheryl Conrad, uh, and that uh, males are much more uh, sensitive to stress and cell damage than females, unless it gets really chronic, and then it's both cases. So at the very end, and this is when I'm talking about the uh, Obama Brain Initiative. And uh, Nate Stamp actually has a depiction of this. And it's a camera with a brain in the lens to represent the goals of the, brand, of the Obama Brain Initiative. And I guess the one thing that, being NASA chief scientist, some of the most beautiful pictures are pictures of the universe and stars being formed and planets being destroyed and that. But the other thing that I think is the most beautiful are pictures of the brain. And so I'm just going to show you a series of pictures right now so you can get a strong appreciation on the complexity of this brain, of this three-pound organ. There's a single cell. There's ones in terms of connecting. 
Uh, again, this is uh, Christine Gall in terms of the cerebral cortex. I mean, just look at the beauty of these neurons and how they're interacting. And you think about it, and you think about the brain, and you think about the challenges. You think about, you know, the billions of neurons, the fact that you have enough myelinated axons that go from here to the moon and back again. And you think about the connectivity, uh, the analysis, the, the information, how much data. You know, there, you've been hearing a lot about big data, big data. Well, the brain itself is big data. And what the brain initiative is going to do and why it's so important is it's really going to help us bring all this data together. It's going to bring in the systems, the, how the neurons, the neural transmitters, the genes, the environment to really understand to really understand, to visualize, to analyze, to uh, really understand um, the brain and how it works. And also, unfortunately, the number of the neurological diseases like depression and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALLS, Lou Gehrig's disease, that are so devastating to us in terms of our society. Understanding how this brain works will actually give us windows and clues in terms of um, helping us cure and prevent uh, the disease break. So here are some of the grand challenges in neuroscience and neuroinformatics. As I said, when I entered high school, uh, what you are to be, you're now becoming. I was going to become a, a neuroscientist. And then I took some courses in college in psychology and, and biology. And I realized that what really drove me was trying to understand the brain. And there's so many important questions uh, because of the complexity and the nature of the science. And what you're going to need in the future is multidisciplinary. You're going to need biologists and social scientists and engineers and physicists and mathematicians all coming together. You're going to need people to invent new technology so that we can see just what MRI has done. And it's pretty, it's pretty vague. We're not getting down to really understanding. It's more of a large look at the brain instead of what we really need to look at the brain. But that technology just came on board about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the amount of data, the explosion, really the grand challenge in neuroscience and neuroinformatics is there and is there for you. And I hope some of you will get interested in the, if you're not already, well, you're all interested in the brain, of course, but, if, but even more interested and will pursue um, science that can help us. So I talked about the brain, but I decided I'd really depict your brain, okay, in terms of... Uh, you know what it is. And again, this prefrontal cortex here, wrist, wrist, wrist. It's really about you. And so I'm going to finish up so I can turn it to you. The instant messenger, as instant messaging, that part of the brain, as you know, is going to grow and grow and grow. But friends and social is really, really important uh, part of what you're going through right now uh, when you're up all night so you can sleep at school. And just so that I'm an equal uh, player, uh, this is your teacher's brain. And I want you to know what keeps them together is a great sense of humor because they are training you and making you the adult and the future for us. Oh, and also, I just want to add here that, as you know, vision is in the back of the brain. Okay? And as you know, your teachers can see with that area when they are looking at you from the back. So keep that note that somehow they've evolved and developed the neuroplasticity to do that. So I want to thank uh, the Nifty Fifty and, and, and Nancy and uh, the uh, wonderful um, uh, person that introduced me today who just got her degree in psychology uh, at George um, Madison University. And uh, again, the source of my material. And I want to thank uh, Jennifer Corey and uh, Noro uh, Noel uh, Venice. And I want to thank uh, Nate in the back of the screen and Annadale High School. Nate, you have to come out, Nate. Nate, Nate. And I'm going to end again with a beautiful picture. And it says, the only 
way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And I want you to know that the universe evolved into the brain. And now I am done. And I open it up if we have time to any questions. So I'm looking to see what time it is. And it's not much better. Are there any questions? Can I take a question? Okay. One or two questions. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult giving a talk when I can't see your guys' face. Much easier now. So do I have a question? Any questions? Nope. <laughs> They're hungry. Okay. Now wait, wait, wait. I know oh. you're hungry, but since you've asked a question, you get a brain patch. Okay. What's your question? And I know we have to go to lunch. Thank you guys very much. You are a wonderful audience. You're going to you're going to go back to your classrooms and go to D lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. That was hard though to see the uh,